Matariki is the Māori name for the star cluster Pleiades, also known as the Seven Sisters. Matariki is also the name for an international network of seven universities that are distinguished by their historic traditions and unique approach to facing contemporary challenges. The Matariki Lecture Series offers a short programme of lectures addressing current research themes or areas of common interest. This time, the lecture series is on race, racism and decolonisation with a specific focus on practical impacts of racism on everyday living. Welcome everyone to the Matariki Lecture Series on Race, Racism and Decolonization. Today here from Tübingen with a special topic on practical impacts on racism, of racism on everyday living. My name is Astrid Franke. I'm a professor of American studies here in Tübingen and amongst other interests I have for the past 10 years or so, studied the persistence of the racial order in the US and also the resistance against it, using literature as a heuristic tool to learn about racism. I will today introduce five scholars to you who will each focus on different areas of everyday life. But before I do so, it is my honor and pleasure to hand over to my colleague Monique Scher. She's Vice President for International Affairs and Diversity, and thus not just formally the right person to welcome you and open our webinar, but also the right person in terms of her concerns and responsibilities. So Monique, I share screen and sound system with you. Hello everyone, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the second Matariki Lecture Series on Race, Racism and Decolonization here in Tübingen. Unfortunately, due to prior commitments, I was not able to make it live with you today. Nevertheless, as Vice President of International Affairs and Diversity at the University of Tübingen, the host of today's event, I wanted to at least welcome you all in this pre-recorded video. Our network has held annual Matariki lectures since 2017. And last year, the Matariki Executive Board voted to transform these annual lectures into a somewhat more frequent sequence of online lecture series on different topics on which our network collaboration focuses. A very good decision, in my opinion, because this way, there will be more opportunities for scholars from Matariki partner universities to get to know each other better, to engage with each other online, and hopefully to initiate joint teaching or research projects. The online format also offers an excellent opportunity to engage in dialogue between a larger circle of students and teachers from all Matariki partner universities. In Tübingen, in March of this year, we were already able to successfully host the first lecture series in this new developed online format. The topic was human evolution and it was very well received. I am truly pleased that we are now also able to be part of this second Matariki lecture series on race, racism and decolonization. The topic is not only extremely important to all of us today, but it is also perfectly in harmony with the University of Tübingen's strategic commitment to diversity and global awareness. I'm therefore particularly delighted about this very promising initiative of the Matariki Secretariat and would like to thank Lucy Terzinski for her excellent preparation and organization of this lecture series, as well as the other organizers and our colleagues from Tübingen Campus TV for the, for the design and communication and implementation of this Tübingen event. Last Thursday, we were already able to take part in some exciting lectures by researchers from the University of Uppsala, the University of Western Australia, and the University of Otago on racism and social determinants of health. Today's lectures will deal with the practical impacts of racism on everyday living. And in addition to our tuning in speakers, you will hear contributions from Dartmouth, Durham, and again, Uppsala. The day after tomorrow, the third event in this series will be on decolonization, including presentations 
from Dartmouth, Queens, UWA, Otago, and Tubingen. A very warm, warm welcome and a huge thank you to all presenters for dedicating some of their precious time to making these valuable contributions and collaborative efforts in this lecture series. I wish all of you, speakers, colleagues, students, and anyone listening, a stimulating set of presentations, lively discussion, and an overall productive and exciting event. Thank you very much. Great. That was Monique um, explaining and embedding what we're doing here uh, in the overall framework. Um, and now we do our best to deliver on what she uh, asked us to do. Um, let me quickly explain our choreography here. Uh, we will hear four presentations of 15 minutes each. One is a split presentation by Nicole and Debarchina. I will briefly introduce each speaker um, separately, they have then 15 minutes, possibly sharing their screen. After a little bit more than an hour, we will launch into a discussion first amongst ourselves. Um, there may be questions, of course, that um, ask for clarification. Um, you, the audience, can write your questions into the Q&A section. And we will either bring them up immediately or collect them a little bit and bring them up when the time has come. So here we go. Let me introduce our first speaker, Dr. Matthew Delmont from Dartmouth in the US. Matthew Delmont is currently distinguished professor of history at Dartmouth College and also uh, a special advisor to the president for faculty diversity. His expertise is African-American history, and here in particular, the 20th century and the civil rights movement. He has published a book entitled The Nicest Kids in Town, American Bandstand, Rock and Roll, and the Struggle for Civil Rights in the 50s, just to give you a time, moment of time, and one on the question why busing failed, race, media, and the national resistance to school desegregation. Most recently, Black Quotidian, Everyday History in African American Newspapers. But it is his next book that seems to be quite relevant to his contribution today. It is a planned book. He has received a Guggenheim Fellowship from the um, National Endowment for the Humanities in order to support research for it. And it's going to be called Half American, the epic story of African Americans fighting World War II at home and abroad. Matthew, the screen and sound is yours. Welcome. Thank you very much, Astrid. Uh, give me just one second to share my screen. It's a pleasure to join you all today from Hanover, New Hampshire. Um, my presentation today is from my upcoming book called Half American. It aims to tell the definitive history of Black Americans in World War II. It'll be published next year by Viking Books, and I'm excited to give you a sneak peek of some of my research. Let me start by taking us back 80 years. Shortly after the attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941, James Thompson, a 26-year-old from Wichita, Kansas, could not sleep. He registered with the Selected Service the prior year, and now, with the U.S. declaring war on Japan and Germany, it was only a matter of time before he was drafted. The prospect of war was frightening to many civilians, but something else was on his mind on that cold Kansas night. Sitting in his family's home in a vibrant black neighborhood amidst a segregated American city, Thompson wrote a letter expressing the concerns that he and many other black Americans felt about joining a racially segregated military. Should I sacrifice my life to live half American? Thompson asked. Will things be better for the next generation in the peace to follow? Would it be demanding too much to demand full citizenship rights in exchange for sacrificing my life? Is the kind of America I know worth defending? Printed in the Pittsburgh Courier, an influential black newspaper, Thompson's letter launched the African-American double victory campaign during World War II to secure victory over fascism abroad and victory over racism at home. I have not been able to shake these words from my head as I worked on this book over the past several years. Should I sacrifice my life to live half American? These words are as relevant today as they were some eight decades ago. I've drawn the title for my book from Thompson's letter, Half American. 
As I've worked on this book for the past several years, I've been struck by how differently the war looks when Black Americans are at the center of the story. When World War II is viewed from an African-American perspective, two important truths emerge. The first is that Black troops played an essential role in helping the United States and allies win World War II. A global war required logistics on a scale that surprised even America's military planners, and Black troops formed the backbone of the US military's logistical forces. Black troops fought courageously when given the opportunity in combat, but it was this behind the scenes support and supply work that helped the allies win the war. The second is that Black Americans saw World War II as a fight against racism abroad and at home. Black Americans understood the war as a fight over ideas and policies as much as a battle over territory and resources. This meant defeating Nazi Germany and the Axis powers was only half the battle. Winning the war would be only a partial victory if the United States did not also overturn racial discrimination at home. This was called the double victory campaign, victory over fascism abroad and victory over racism at home. For Black Americans, the fight against white supremacy continued long after the surrender of the Axis nations. Black veterans returned from the war and became key players in the civil rights movement across the country. For decades after World War II, Black veterans fought for the principles of democracy in America. During our time together today, I'd like to focus on the important roles Black troops played on and after D-Day, as well as how Black veterans helped lead the civil rights movement after the war. More than 1,700 Black troops crossed the English Channel on D-Day, June 6, 1944. If you look at pictures of the Normandy invasion, like this one, you'll see silver anti-aircraft balloons tethered to ships. Many of these were manned by the 320th Barrage Balloon Battalion, a Black unit whose men were assigned to protect more than 150 vessels during the channel crossing. Landing in different zones on both Utah and Omaha beaches, members of the 320th Balloon Battalion searched for each other amidst the chaos of battle. After nightfall, they worked in groups of three and four to launch a dozen of their hydrogen-filled balloons over the beaches. The balloons hovered at low altitudes, making it more challenging for German planes to strafe the coast or accurately drop their bombs. Enemy planes that dared to fly at low altitudes risked hitting the thin steel cables armed with explosives that dangled from the balloons. These floating mines formed a silver curtain of defense along the coast. Waverly Woodson Jr., a pre-med student at Philadelphia's Lincoln University and a medic with the 320th, performed heroically on D-Day. En route to Omaha Beach, his landing craft hit a mine and was torn apart by a Nazi shell. The man, man next to him was blown up and Woodson feared that his own shrapnel wounds would kill him. Another medic bandaged Woodson's gashes as the ship drifted to shore. Woodson waded through chest high water and scrambled for shelter on the beach. Woodson set up a medical aid station and over the next 30 hours, he tended to more than 200 wounded men. He patched wounds, removed bullets and dispensed blood plasma. He amputated a soldier's foot and saved three men from drowning. Black newspapers hailed Woodson as the number one invasion hero. In the military newspaper, Stars and Stripes, said Woodson and his fellow medics covered themselves with glory on D-Day. Hollywood filmmaker John Ford was on the beach on D-Day, directing a Coast Guard camera crew. He marveled at the bravery of Black troops who drove amphibious trucks called ducks. He said, I remember watching one Black driver in a duck loaded with supplies. He dropped them on the beach, unloaded, went back for more. Shells landed around him. The Germans were really after him. He avoided every obstacle and just kept going back and forth, back and forth, completely calm. I thought, by God, if anyone deserves a medal, that man does. Ford considered leaving his relatively safe place to get a photograph of the soldier, but thought better of it. The hell with it, Ford thought. I was willing to admit that he was braver than I was. Landing thousands of troops on D-Day was an amazing feat but it was only the first part of the battle. Reinforcing and supplying these soldiers as they pushed across the countryside in hedgerows was the second and larger phase. By the end of June, the Allies landed 850,000 troops in 150,000 vehicles at Normandy. D-Day simply stood for the day of the invasion. Thousands of troops landed on the French coast on D-Day plus one, D-Day plus two, and for weeks thereafter. All of these men required food, ammunition, and replacement parts for airplanes, tanks, and trucks. Black troops were even more important during this phase because they were the backbone of the Army's service and supply units. As American combat forces pushed into Nazi-occupied France, they could only go as far as their supply lines would take them, 
which meant they could only go as far as Black supply troops could take them. Although the D-Day contributions of Black troops would be obscured over time, contemporary journalists praised their efforts. Visiting France in August, New York Times war correspondent um, Raymond Daniel compared witnessing the work of Black service and supply troops to going backstage in the theater. He wrote, I got a glimpse of the scene shifters, stagehands, and electricians who contributed their unseen parts of the drama unfolding before the eyes of those in front of the floodlight, footlight. Here were the men and machinery behind the lines whose toil and sweat had made possible the victorious lightning thrust of our armies toward Paris and the Seine. You could say black troops during World War II were the essential workers of their day. By October, Allied troops led by General George Patton, General Bernard Montgomery, and Lieutenant General Omar Bradley had advanced more than 400 miles, liberating Paris and Brussels and entering Western Germany. Time magazine said it was this miracle of supply that put the Nazis on their heels. Ali Stewart, a black war correspondent wrote, although port battalions and work troops are not generally regarded on par with frontline combat troops, it is a matter of record that no group of soldiers in this theater has done more to make Allied victory possible. They liberate no towns, see no flags, drink no champagne, nor kiss happy girls. Yet when things become critical, the first cry of the high command is, give us more supplies. The heart of the Allied supply effort in Western Europe was a truck convoy driven mostly by black quartermaster troops called the Red Ball Express. As three dozen divisions fought their way across France and Belgium, the Allies had to move 20,000 tons of supplies every day from the invasion beaches to the front. General Bradley later said, logistics, this was the dullest subject in the world, but logistics were the lifeblood of the allied armies in France. Without the black truck drivers and the supplies they delivered, allied forces could not move, shoot, or eat. With most of the French rail system in ruins, the allies turned to a fleet of thousands of six by six, two and a half ton General Motors cargo trucks, nicknamed the Jimmy or Deuce and a Half. These trucks and the black men who drove them made the US Army the most mobile and mechanized force in the war and gave the Allies a decided strategic advantage over the German infantry divisions, which were overly reliant on rail, wagon trains, and horses to move troops and supplies. From August through November 1944, 23,000 American truck drivers and cargo loaders, 70% of whom were black, moved more than 400,000 tons of ammunition, gasoline, medical supplies, and rations to battlefronts in France, Belgium, and Germany. When the Allies reached the Seine River nearly two weeks earlier than expected, the truck convoy allowed the Allies to chase the retreating German armies without overrunning their supply lines. General Patton concluded that the two and a half ton truck is our most valuable weapon. And Colonel John D. Eisenhower, the Supreme Commander's son, argued that without the red ball truck drivers, the advances across France could not have been made. Back across the channel, the ports in and around London continued to hum with war activity. In the six months after D-Day, the port of Southampton was the busiest in the world. More than 6,400 vessels left Southampton bound for France, carrying nearly 2 million military personnel, 170,000 vehicles, and over 1.7 million tons of supplies. Black troops made up more than 90% of the port companies at Southampton more than half of the truck companies and almost all of the quartermaster and engineer general service regiments. Almost everything the Allies transported to the front passed through the hands of at least one black American. The Allies push toward Germany would have sputtered to a halt without these black port troops working around the clock. Having spent the past several years researching this book, I can say definitively that black Americans played a vital role in helping the Allies win the war. When black veterans came back to America at the end of the war, however, they returned to a country that disrespected their service and was openly hostile to them and their communities. On June 29, 1945, for example, Mississippi Senator James O. Eastland rose to speak on the floor of the Senate. He described black soldiers as dismal failures in combat and said they had disgraced the flag of their country. Eastland and his ilk understood that black Americans greeted victory abroad by redoubling their fight for civil rights at home and that Black veterans were important leaders in this battle for freedom and equality. For Americans committed to upholding Jim Crow segregation, Black veterans in their military service were extremely dangerous. That day on the floor of the Senate, Eastland described African Americans as an inferior race before concluding, I am proud that the purest form of white blood flows in my veins. I know that the white race is the superior race. It has ruled the world. It has given us civilization. 
is responsible for all the progress on Earth. If these words are upsetting today, imagine how they sounded to Black veterans who risked their lives, saw their buddies killed, fighting for democracy and freedom abroad. This is where we can see the biggest difference in what World War II meant for Black Americans. While America achieved a military victory over Germany and Japan in 1945, that was not the end of the war for Black Americans. An equally important battle against racism continued on the home front. After four years of brutal war, returning to the way things used to be was obviously appealing to millions of white citizens, but it was the exact opposite of what Black Americans were demanding. For Black Americans, returning to normal meant going back to a system of legalized racial apartheid in the South, where racial hierarchies were enforced through lynching and voter disenfranchisement. It meant riding in the back of the bus, stepping off the sidewalk to let a white person pass, and be denied access to lunch counters and swimming pools, all in order to remind you that you are a second-class citizen. In all regions of the country, returning to normal for Black Americans and being harassed and beaten by police, not being able to get a mortgage to live in most neighborhoods, attending segregated and under-resourced schools, and being the last hired and first fired in the workplace. The last thing Black people wanted was a return to a country that treated them as half American. They saw the war as part of a much larger struggle to take democracy off of parchment and give it life. That's what the Double Victory Campaign was about, making America a democracy for everyone. Black veterans swelled the ranks of, the, of civil rights organizations and became key players in Black freedom struggles across the country. I'll reference just a few names here. Reverend Hosea Williams, who earned a Purple Heart in France, serving as an infantryman under General Patton, was beaten almost to death when he tried to drink from a white-only water fountain in Savannah, Georgia after the war. He worked alongside Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference to lead Black voter registration drives in the South. Woman Army Corps veteran W. Johnson Roundtree used the GI Bill to attend Howard University Law School. She established a law firm in Washington, D.C and won a landmark civil rights case that helped secure a ban on racial segregation in interstate bus travel. Veteran Oliver Brown protested school segregation in Topeka, Kansas. His daughter, Linda Brown, was one of the students at the center of the historic Brown versus Board of Education decision. Medgar Evers loaded cargo for the black truck drivers on the Red Ball Express, who transported supplies across France after D-Day. After earning two bronze stars on the beachhead of Normandy and in Northern France, Evers celebrated his 21st birthday in 1946 by leading a group of Black veterans who attempted to register to vote in Decatur, Mississippi, only to be turned away for, by a white mob with guns. He said, I had been on Omaha Beach. All we Black soldiers wanted was to be ordinary citizens. We fought during the war for America, Mississippi included. Now, after the Germans and Japanese hadn't killed us, it looked as though the white Mississippians would. Evers continued to fight for civil rights until he was assassinated in 1963. He was buried with full military honors at Arlington National Cemetery. Let me conclude by emphasizing that the stories we choose to tell about the past matter. This is especially true about World War II. Stories of the war that do not reckon with the Black American experience leave us ill-prepared to understand the present and rudderless as we try to navigate the future. Ignorance is a luxury we cannot afford. If we tell the right stories about the past, about the war, we can meet the resurgence of white supremacy as a deeply entrenched aspect of America's political history and cultural life, rather than a surprise or anomaly. If we tell the right stories about the war, we can see modern racial justice activism as the continuation of decades long struggles to make America an actual functioning democracy. If we tell the right stories about the war, we can finally honor the sacrifices of the black veterans, defense industry workers and citizens who fought on foreign battlefields and in their own cities and towns so that no one would ever again be treated as half American. Thank you. Yeah, thanks Matthew for starting us off um, with this uh, historical irony really of fighting for democracy with a segregated army, but also I think by uh, reminding us how much it matters what narratives we tell each other. And I think we may, we may come back to, to this, I think. So let me go over to Chris, Chris Bevan from Durham University. 
Um, Chris joined Durham Law School as an associate professor in property law in 2019 after six years in the School of Law at the University of Nottingham. Chris is deputy dean, a, a dean and director of research at Durham Law School. He graduated from the University of Cambridge in 2007 with degrees in both modern languages and law. Prior to entering academia, Chris practiced as a common law barrister specializing in matters of land, housing, and family law. He is very dedicated to teaching, has published a textbook, and been awarded prizes for excellence in teaching. His research interests are situated on the intersection between land, housing, homelessness, and social welfare law. He has published widely on these matters in a number of uh, leading law journals, including the Modern Law Review, Law Quarterly Review, the Cambridge, uh, Cambridge Law Journal. It's good to have you here, Chris, and um, I hand over to you. Thank you very much, Astrid. I hope uh, you can all see my slides on the screen. Uh, let me know if you can't. Um, okay, so a slightly different tone, I think, to my uh, presentation or a slightly different perspective, because I naturally come at this from a legal perspective. My paper is entitled Homelessness, Race and Law. And why am I speaking about this? Well, before uh, joining academia, as Astrid mentioned, I practiced as a barrister for a long time. So I worked close hand firsthand with people who experienced discrimination and disadvantage, whether that be from a local authority, whether that be in housing, and particularly in homelessness, so in the context of homelessness. And what I observed from my legal practice was this discrimination and differentiation in treatment of people from a BAME background, Black and minority ethnic background, as compared with their white counterparts. And now that I'm in academia, I work with homelessness charities, organizations and groups to investigate the experiences of BAME people in relation to housing matters uh, in the UK, but principally in England. So this paper is part of an ongoing piece of research that I'm engaged, with, uh, engaged in at Durham with a network of stakeholders, looking at things like how race impacts homelessness, the experience of homelessness, but also the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic um, and also the financial crisis that we've been experiencing, particularly in Europe, but also in the US uh, over the last decade or so. So this paper is part of that ongoing research that myself and a team of researchers are engaged in. Okay, next slide. So what is this paper really about then? Well, I've put some context for you on the slide. And what this context is, is the latest or the clearest data that we have, uh, the latest full year data on the experience of BAME people in terms of homelessness and accessing homelessness services in England. And the context is, I think, striking. And I don't think you need to be from a legal background or, or any particular background to understand the seriousness of what this data reveals. So as it says on the slides, one in 23 black households uh, will be homeless or threatened with homelessness as compared with one in 83 households of all other ethnicities combined. 11% of homeless people applying for homelessness help are black, even though in England, black people make up just 3% of the population. This is perhaps the next uh, uh, point is perhaps the most striking of all. Almost a quarter of people making homelessness applications in the last 12 months came from BAME groups, even though taken together, the BAME population in England is only around 11%. And then this final statistic, a BAME person becomes homeless or threatened with homelessness in England every eight minutes. So that, I think, well, I hope, 
really demonstrates the importance and the impetus to do more in this area, to investigate and hopefully, hopefully to improve the position uh, for BAME uh, groups, populations in England. Goes without saying that having a stable home, somewhere warm, somewhere safe is vital to all of our health, physical, mental well-being. But it also impacts on our opportunities, our career prospects, our educational opportunities also. So it's really hard to overstate the importance of having a home. And therefore, really, it makes the case again of the importance of tackling this discrimination and these problems that we see, this overrepresentation of BAME individuals in the homelessness context in England. Now, of course, I have to be well aware, and this is something that's come out of the research network that I'm a part of at Durham, that there's a lot of sensitivity in this area. And I'm always conscious when I'm talking about BAME populations, that that term itself, BAME, is not a term that all people of those communities favor. I use it in this context, uh, if you like, as it's generally accepted in the housing realm as being the most appropriate term. But I do know, for those of you listening, that this is not a term that is uncontroversial. You know, it's, it's difficult, for example, to catch all people within a term. And of course, we're all individuals. So grouping people together is by its nature problematic. So I do note that. Um, OK, on to my next slide. I thought it'd be quite useful um, to demonstrate what the research network that I'm involved with has revealed so far in terms of the causes of BAME homelessness. And of course, many of the causes of homelessness apply to white households as well, but we've been researching what, specifically what are the principal causes of homelessness in the BAME population. And these, uh, as you can see from the slide, these are the key causes of homelessness in these populations that we've identified. Social exclusion, poverty, and discrimination is absolutely front and center. Many people from a BAME background will find themselves homeless because of the inherent discrimination which they experience, whether that be through employment practices, whether that may be through landlords when they seek a private rent, or whether that may be in their interactions with the local authority. There is a definite problem with discrimination, and this has a correlation to homelessness in the BAME population. The next major cause is that many in the BAME population are less well off, have fewer resources in order to overcome housing precarity. Now, that may sound like a generalization, but statistically speaking, BAME homeless people tend to have less financial resource available to them in order to assist them out of homelessness. So that's a key problem here. Other causes relate to domestic violence, family breakdown and housing stress. There is a particular uh, relationship between BAME households and often multi-generational households. So multiple generations living within the same home. This can lead to issues in relation to family breakdown and as I say, housing stress, overcrowding, for example, which can lead to homelessness. The next uh, cause of homelessness relates to certain ethnic uh, groups, but not others. So th this is where we have to be sensitive to this catch-all phrase, BAME, because of course, it, it, to some extent, it is problematic. But in certain populations, there is forced marriage, and that can lead to increases in homelessness. Immigration status often impacts access to housing. In England, we have very strict rules in relation to accessing housing if you are an immigrant. And that acts as a barrier to people from BAME communities accessing the, the housing that they need. And finally, and it's something that I touched on at the beginning, but I, I flag it up here as another, uh, if you like, a highlighted theme that comes out of the research, the racial discrimination in housing and employment. Part of the work that we've been doing with the network is speaking to homeless people themselves, people who've experienced homelessness from BAME uh, populations. And I can tell you that they regularly report 
examples of ex quite extreme racial discrimination in terms of accessing housing and in their employment uh, opportunities and practices. All of these things can contribute to the greater incidence of homelessness in the Bain population, as the research that I'm leading on demonstrates. And the next slide really feeds into that, which is what is the experience of BAME people when they are in the system, if you like, for seeking homelessness support. In other words, what happens when people from a BAME background approach their local authority and ask for help because they are homeless? What experiences are they having? What's the interaction with local authorities? And this is quite interesting because the research is showing trends which are well, negative trends, problematic experiences of BAME people in this homelessness context. And it's, if you like, it's these experiences, which for me are the catalyst for thinking more deeply about BAME homelessness and what role the law can play. So the first thing to note is that there is a, a distinct lack of awareness amongst uh, certain BAME populations of the homelessness support that is available. And this lack of awareness means that many people who could be assisted to avoid homelessness find themselves homeless because they don't realise the services are there to be accessed. There are also issues in relation to pathways through the services. So many of the homeless people that I've spoken to as part of the research have revealed stories of being pushed away, turned away from, from support based on racial grounds. So they, their pathway through the services is often blocked or inhibited as a result of, of racial discrimination and harassment. The next part, interaction with local authorities, homelessness departments. Well, there is a worrying trend amongst the research, demonstrated through the research, that many homeless people, BAME homeless people, experience very negatively their interactions with homelessness departments. They are routinely talked down to, patronized, uh, misunderstood or misrepresented as a result of their particular BAME background. This is very problematic and comes out loud and clear from the research also. And finally, uh, a more systematic problem here is the lack of local authority strategic vision on BAME homelessness. What we're finding is that many local authority areas do not have policies, research groups, members of their team who are thinking about these issues in relation to BAME experience of homelessness services. Most local authorities are, for want of a better expression, pale, male and stale, and they do not reflect the population that they are serving. And this I think is part of the, the problematic nature of the experiences of BAME people when it comes to homelessness. So what's, that's, if you like, the, the impetus for, for me and the research that I'm doing. What role then for the law? And this is where my legal training comes in. We've identified the problem. We've identified the ongoing issues in relation to BAME experiences in this area. What can the law do? Well, there's been a lot of law. We had the Race Relations Act, Relations Act of 19, uh, 1976. We have an Equality Act from 2010, various homelessness legislation, all of which says on its face that it is unlawful to discriminate against people based on their race. So the law on its face is anti-discrimination. However, the law is not fulfilling its potential here because if you like, it acts as a, a floor, not a ceiling. In other words, it states quite clearly, there should be no direct overt discrimination. What it doesn't do is tackle the real problem, which is the hidden indirect discrimination, which my research network is exposing in terms of the BAME population. What we're seeing is that there is gatekeeping of resources, that there is racial harassment and discrimination by housing officers on the ground. And more, um, perhaps more technically than that, some of the inherent uh, principles of law are by their nature operating in a manner which could be indirectly discriminatory. For example, 
the housing legislation will afford housing to certain groups of people where accommodation is available to them. That has to be interpreted. That is a concept which the courts have interpreted and the evidence supports a finding that the interpretation itself is indirectly discriminatory against BAME populations. So there is discrimination that goes to the very heart of the legal principles that determine who gets homelessness support in England. Another quick example for you, the law has relatively recently imported a requirement for local connection. You have to show that you have a local connection to your particular geographical area in England before you get assistance. Now, you can imagine that if you are from a certain BAME population, maybe you are an immigrant, maybe family members have to come to England to join you from abroad, this local connection requirement is going to be very difficult for you to demonstrate and may prevent you from gaining access to housing support. And in this way, this requirement for local uh, connection can indirectly discriminate against certain communities in England. I could go on with, with, with various examples. The key point really here is that what our research network is demonstrating is that the discrimination in housing and homelessness runs very deep. You can spot it talking to homeless people who will tell you their experiences, but the law has a role because the legal principles themselves perpetrate largely indirect discrimination against certain ethnicities and certain populations. So what I am going to do as I move to the next stage of the research is look at how we can reform homelessness law in England to tackle this indirect and hidden discrimination, which continues to blight uh, our populations in England. The data on BAME homelessness that I started this uh, paper with goes back decades. The experience of non-white households has long been a problem in England. And I think the time has come for us to refocus and explore the potentiality of law to tackle uh, this discrimination and how new legislation, new legal principles could be framed building on this research to tackle discrimination in this context. And I'm conscious I'm going to, I've gone slightly over time. So Astrid, I will stop there. Um, as I say, a different flavor from the paper we heard before mine, but hopefully interesting for you all nonetheless. Well, thanks, um, Chris. It was a different flavor, but I think it, um, it fit quite beautifully um to the first talk which prepared the ground of people who were still fighting uh, a legal form of segregation that is segregation by law that was still very obvious to what you are now arguing are much more covert ways of you know disadvantaging uh certain groups of people I think you also brought in the socioeconomic perspective in this, perhaps this term intersectionality. Again, I'm sure um, we will. Um, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, oh, thanks. Um, uh, thanks, uh, Nicole. Um, and what I will do is I'll take the rest of the minutes to um, talk about the disadvantaged international scholar. And I'm sure there would be several continuities with the points that Nicole already um, raised. Um, um, since uh, the pandemic last year, actually, I've had numerous conversations uh, with my colleagues and students about how difficult um, life has been uh, without social contact, uh, away from family and friends, dealing with um, um, aging parents, uh, anxiety over the fragile health of grandparents, bringing up kids without any support network, and in general, how living life alone has affected people's emotional health and also their um, academic output. Uh, we've talked about being kind to each other, about giving students um, leeway with their submission deadlines and negotiating their workload um, so that they can cope with these extraordinary pressures of social isolation. Um, in these extraordinary times, there was as if um, a collective will 
to visualize the ver this very important connection between people's private lives and um, their professional lives. Um, but I, like other scholars with migrant backgrounds, um, I, I just could not uh, help think how for many of us from the global south who have moved to the developed world uh, to study and work here, this social isolation is so much part of our everyday lives. And we manage every effect of this isolation, often alone and um, unseen by the world around us. Um, understand that I in no way want to kind of belittle uh, the experiences or anxieties of people here or anywhere else during this pandemic experiences, but um, I only want to appeal for a similar recognition or interest in the private lives of uh, migrant scholars as it has a very um, real impact on their academic lives. And if we don't, we run the risk of uh, normalizing by, uh, by way of invisibilizing their disadvantaged uh, situation. Um, if we pay attention to the private lives of international scholars, uh, we will encounter the various hindrances that they have to overcome to establish themselves in a foreign academic setup. Uh, it begins with, of course, getting the correct visa, residence permit, accommodation, figuring out all these institutional resources and fundings available and so on. And all of this takes uh, time and energy and sometimes even money, say in the case of visas and permits that many of us from the third world countries have to routinely pay to live here or to attend conferences, let's say in other developed countries. Not seeing these hurdles amount to perpetuating the same global inequalities. For example, uh, most students from Asia or Africa who come to do their doctoral studies in Germany um, come here with a scholarship and most PhD programs offer funds uh, max for a period of three years to complete one's dissertation. So these students are expected to operate under a very tight schedule while figuring out their lives in a foreign country, where to stay, where to shop, where to eat, how to study, who to talk to, um, how to deal with um, imposter syndrome, how to save money for that savings account, how to get a doctor's appointment, how to deal with um, casual racism or manage a long distance relationship, right? Um, so they are expected to be productive with little recognition of the emotional uh, duress of living away from family and friends, and in general, um, all things familiar. Uh, and to add to that, many of us from the third world who moved to Germany uh, didn't speak the language when we first arrived here. So um, it's so inserting ourselves in a social network of friends or colleagues, it was also not easy. Uh, professional lives um, are amazed too in the absence of mentors or role models. It is hard to figure out which academic organizations to join, which conferences to attend, which extracurricular activities uh, to participate in to ensure our survival in the competitive world of academia. Being an outsider means um, remaining constantly unsure of oneself. A real consequence of being an outsider is remaining outside of information networks. So which mailing list to be a part of, where to find job advertisements, where to publish, how to find collaborators and so on. Um, and without friends and family, it is hard to access these little nuggets of informal information that makes life a smooth and comfortable. We don't think about it as much, but imagine if you could save all the time that you spend researching on how to do this and that in Germany and someone just offered you all that information in a casual conversation, right? International scholars lack these small, but uh, you know, everyday kind of privileges. They are also disproportionately affected by academic setbacks. Uh, if they cannot find a job immediately after they graduate, they would have to pack their bags and leave. If they cannot finish on time, they might have to leave the country in between their studies. Sometimes these dissertations are never finished. Uh, if we do not pay careful attention to what goes on um, in the private lives of scholars with migrant backgrounds, the problem of retention uh, will always um, remain a puzzle. Most universities these days aspire to have an international presence and actively seek um, international uh, st students of diverse backgrounds. But um, without clear strategies to retain these scholars after their studies, 
Um, the whole exercise seemed to be an immense uh, wastage of resources and potential. Um, at present, even if there appears to be a sizable amount of students from the global south in German academia, their number noticeably diminishes at postdoctoral level and almost is negligible at professorial uh, level. I think if we could retain more of these senior uh, scholars of migrant backgrounds, the younger uh, scholars could have someone they, could, they can relate to, uh, someone accessible to reach out to, and uh, whose very presence in some sense um, shows it is possible to make it in German academia in spite of the structural disadvantages that they face. Um, just as like Nicole said, um, quick reflections. Uh, so possible strategies that I think um, that can help retain international scholars, and we can probably discuss this at length during the Q&A, are, as I said, um, an interest in their personal lives. By this way, you sort of at least register the problems that they face, and you, you basically, we can get to know their problems. That is like the first step towards, um, you know, you get to know the problem. And then I think uh, mentorship programs can also help because that way too, I think you have more communication with the student. Um, and these mentors not, do not necessarily, I think, have to be people of um, similar, uh, you know, like migrant backgrounds. This could be just someone who is in a position higher up, but is interested in the private lives uh, through everyday kind of conversations. Uh, you know, they're in conversation with the students. Um, that could be another way of knowing what the what are the problems faced by these um, students. And then there could be um, international scholars networks, uh, like some kind of platforms where these problems and solutions can be discussed. And this again, kind of is dependent on the, 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 their number, right? If there are no, no international scholars, there would be no network. Uh, and then uh, a fourth point could be university administrative offices. I've seen this in Tübingen who work in close liaison with government agencies. So, um, so you have like these kind of middle, middle people, middle person who sort of can, um, because sometimes just understanding the know-how of government, especially in Germany, a lot of the information is available in German. And if you don't know the language, it's, it's, good, it's very hard to kind of navigate these websites uh, and process all the information. And the fifth point um, would be some kind of flexibility in the study program structure. So if you set out and if you say like three years for everyone, irrespective of like, you know, what disadvantages they have, like that just, I think doesn't work because you don't then take into account that not everyone starts. I mean, this is about the level, it's not a level playing field that people start out with. And um, generally my last point would be the, this general atmosphere of kindness that we have sort of um, agreed upon during these um, years of the pandemic. I think it would be nice if we could um, <laughs> kind of sustain this atmosphere. And um, so for example, when I begin a class these days, I always ask if everything is fine with my students and so on and so forth. And I think um, there is a need for uh, this space uh, where people can, uh, we do this in Tübingen, but I, um, I do not think this is uh, a very widespread practice. And I would really stress the importance of this interpersonal space because I think it's not just about making people feel good, but if your students feel good, they are also going to be more resourceful and their academic output is also going to um, be affected by this, right? So yeah, uh, that's all uh, that I have to add. Yeah, thank you. Um, I still think that things are in a nice flow, uh, even though we're a bit over time, but so I will flow over <laughs> to Matthias immediately. Um, but I just wanted to emphasize that I still think, um, even though everyone is talking about slightly different fields of practice and um, things build on one another here. Um, so Matthias Gardel is not Nathan Söderblom Professor in Comparative Religion and co-director of research at the Center for Multidisciplinary Studies of Racism at Uppsala University in Sweden. For his PhD, he studied Black religious nationalism based on several years of fieldwork 
the material that black nationalists themselves produced and previously classified material, revealing the intelligence agency's efforts to disrupt the scene of black independence activism. His postdoctoral research has continued to draw on ethnographic methods to inquire into white radical nationalism, white power culture, occult fascism, political Islam, human bombs, torture history, anti-Muslim racism or Islamophobia, white racist political violence, the entangled history of racism and religion, the effective dimensions of radical nationalism, contemporary fascist fiction, white racist lone wolf tactics, and anti-Black, anti-Roma, and anti-Muslim racisms in Sweden. He has published widely and many, many monographs. He lists 11. Um, his latest publication are Lone Wolf Race Warriors and White Genocide. And he's going to talk about race as technology. So Matthias, I invite you to share your screen. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yes. OK. I. I hope that I, I'm going to check the watch here to see that I also will not, will not do with the, the time too much. Uh, anyway, thank you for inviting me. I'd like to take the, the, um, the t opportunity to share a definition of racism as a technology that I'm working on. Uh, that is, um, and of course, technology here is the key concept. And to me, that signifies all the material and immaterial methods, procedures, organizations, knowledges, ideas, tools, skills, and mindsets involved in the process of production. Or to use the definition of Ursula Franklin, technology is the way things are done around here, end of quote. Accordingly, racism is not an abstract problem but may be defined um, as a technology, as a racism as a technology, firstly classifies people in distinct kinds that could be called varieties if you want to speak with Carl Linnaeus, or races, cultures, peoples, ethnicities, each bestowed with an assumed inherited essence and positioned between the poles of worthy and unworthy life. Secondly, racism as a technology produces the people that belongs to a certain place and also therefore has the right to feel at home and whose well-being shall be protected at the, ex at the expense of those excluded um, from the people who may be killed or left to die to secure the welfare of valuable life. Thirdly, Racism as technology achieves and maintains, and I think this is key, an unequal distribution of status, privileges, opportunities, and death to people on the basis of the classificatory kind they are presumed to belong to. Racism as a technology furthermore situates people according to the logic that every kind should be in its proper place, and lastly, naturalizes the established order of power and guards the identities, borders, and flows that the technology creates and privileges. And I will walk you through each of these constitutive elements of, of racism. So bear with me. So firstly, um, racism, and I think it's important to recognize that racism is not a universal phenomenon that has always existed everywhere, but it has a history and it changes across time and space. It's important to remember that racism is not dependent on the uh, concept of biological race, as racism predates biology and genetics with many centuries. The first racial order to emerge in Europe was established during the Spanish Reconquista in the late 15th century, when Jews and Muslims were expelled or forcibly converted to Christianity and their heirs relegated to a secondary status as distinct races uh, of impure blood. 
In the course of history, racism has thereafter been legitimized with reference to philology, law, natural history, zoology, phrenology, anthropology, and ethnology. The concept of race was eventually biologized in the late 19th, early 20th century, only to be phased out again as both uh, scientifically and ethically unsound in the aftermath of the Second World War, after which the idea of inherited essence was embedded in alternative concepts, including ethnicity, culture, and religion. As Malcolm X used to say, racism is like Cadillac. They bring out a new model every year. Racism as a technology produces the people who is said to belong to a certain place. And I will illustrate this and lots of my other points here now with the case study of Sweden, where uh, in which Sweden here is typically construed as a culturally, religiously, ethnically, and linguistically homogeneous nation of white, blonde and blue-eyed people who speak Swedish in their homes. Until recently, when hordes of non-white, non-Luther and non-Swedish speaking aliens began crossing the borders to undermine the social harmony of the good old days. Now, and I think this is very important to understand, this imagined Sweden only exists in nationalist discourse that calls Swedish homogeneity into existence by declaring it lost. The politicized nostalgic projections of Swedish homogeneity back in an imagined past involves a violent erasure of all Jewish, Roma, Finnish, Tornadalian, and indigenous army people from Swedish history. It was only after all in the year 2000 that official uh, government in Sweden, the state recognized that we in fact had national uh, minorities as the language put it, uh, living in Sweden even before Sweden became Sweden. This of course also would erase everyone with migrant background and that symbolically points to the violence, the project of re-establishing a cultural homogeneity would necessitate if ever tried in practice. I don't know if you heard it, but Swedish uh, democracy celebrates mu uh, with much public uh, publicity in Sweden, its centennial anniversary this year, a celebration that symbolically repeats the exclusion of the Roma community that only were given equal rights to housing, schooling, and voting in the 1960s after the Roma civil rights movements. So Swedish democracy and American democracy is about of equal age. Swedish court historians May, see, uh, may seek to obscure this fact by typically pointing out that no, 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 the Roma people were not excluded from Swedish democracy because they were Roma, but because uh, they were not registered as citizens, which they couldn't be because they were Roma and not Swedes. Now, these days, that history repeats itself as a Roma people from Romania and Bulgaria are denied the same right of residence as every other kind of EU citizen. Again, not officially due to the fact that they are Roma, but because they don't have sufficient means to support themselves, because they are not allowed to work, because they don't have the rights to residence. Uh, <clears throat> And in fact, the Roma people is the only category of EU citizens 
that are caught in this catch-22 of racialized bureaucracy. And I think, and you might correct me if I'm wrong, that this same thing applies to Germany and most other European countries where the Roma people constitutes the largest uh, minority of. <clears throat> Police records in Sweden show that regulations such as bans against sitting down for more than two hours, occupying a space of more than 60 square centimeters and camping in the woods are put into effect <clears throat> only when the violator happens to be Roma. In a study we did, the, we calculated the costs involved for evicting Roma people from all their, their uh, informal settlements each time they try to stay somewhere. And it was 10 times higher than what it would have involved, uh, the cost that would have been involved in building housing that had allowed the Roma to pay their ways by working and studying and live a life of dignity. We did a, like, um, racism also achieves and maintains an unequal distribution of status, privileges, opportunities, and death to people depending on the classificatory kind they are presumed to belong to. And this is shown over and over and over again. We recently did a quantitative study of anti-Black racism and discrimination in the Swedish labor market that was based on the total population of the workforce in Sweden. That is every resident between 19 and 65 years of age, roughly 6 million people. And it showed that Black Swedes had less, ex uh, have less, uh, less access to the labor market, less yearly gross, uh, income, substantially less um, disposable income, less possibilities to do a high status career or acquire a managerial position compared to the rest of the population. After taking educational attainment, regional, sectorial factors into account. Interestingly, uh, the study showed that Afro-Swedes are less likely to get hired if they have a post-secondary education of three years or more. And this is unique for Afro-Swedes. Every other category of Swede, Swedish citizen, if they are unemployed, they start to study, they get more merits and they get hired. That doesn't apply to Black Swedes. This graph shows that it's 10 times less likely that a Swede would have a black boss than a boss from the rest of the population. Moreover, in the unlikely event that a black person attain a managerial position, he or she will earn around 75% of what a person from the rest of the population would earn if he or she had a similar, similar position and education. Like in, in uh, what I thought, uh, saw from the German presentation here, COVID also reveals the fact that racism is, uh, can be seen as an unequal distribution of death because, and I tried to show that in, in the picture here, this is from Stockholm region, uh, places with excess of death, exactly matches places and areas and spaces where uh, non-Swedish residents predominantly live. So this takes us to the two final parts of the definition. Racism as a technology situates people according to the logic that every kind should be in its proper place and naturalizes the power structure that has been created and guards the borders and flows that the technology creates and privileges. Now, in Swedish society, the shift towards neoliberal policies has for the past 25 years gradually undermined the once famous Swedish model. The growth of income inequality in Sweden is the largest among all the OECD countries. 2018 
Statistics Sweden reported the greatest gap between the countries rich and poor since the measurement began. During the same time, Sweden transformed to the most segregated society in all of Europe. The basis of segregation, of course, is class. But as class distinctions, coup varies with structural discrimination on the basis of racialized ethnicity, religion, and culture, class distinctions increasingly have acquired a visual dimension in the segregated urban areas of the rich and poor. Studies of urban inequalities shows a similar pattern across Swedish, um, all, all the major Swedish cities where separated and stigmatized areas for low income re residents um, have been increasingly racialized. This picture shows Gothenburg, second, uh, the second largest city in Sweden on the West Coast, uh, where research showed that there is a nine year difference in re life expectancy between a a uh, black man born and raised in Bergen, one of these stigmatized underclass areas, and a uh, man born and raised in Longedrag, a predominantly white upper class area. Same city, same year, same transportation system. The tram number 11 transport people between Bergen and Longedrag, but nine years difference in life expectancy. This, by the way, shows that Sweden has become a reflection of the racialized global uh, inequal, uh, unequal distribution of wealth, resources, and possibilities to live a, a good and long life. A Swede born and raised in an underclass area, such as Bergen, will live as long as a man born and raised in Vietnam, whereas a rich, where people born and raised in a rich, suburb would live as long as a man born and raised in Monaco. <clears throat> of course, uh, racism, um, structural racism is not the only part of racism that is violent. Um, we also have a lot of subjective violence, a lot of racist violence in Sweden. Um, in a study I made in 2018 that covered every mosque and Islamic association with prayer hall facilities in Sweden, showed that a whopping 59%, six out of 10 of all mosques in Sweden have been exposed to physical assault ranging from vandalism to arson. Pictures here in the background of the graphs show burning masks in the cities of Malmö, Borås, Eskilstuna, Stockholm, and Örebro. And finally, uh, last, last slide and minute, um, the processes of naturalization of the racist order of things also involves stigmatizing critical studies of racism by labeling them ideological and political. Whereas of course, it's a uh, fact of the facts on the ground shows that it's the other way around. Those who claim that Sweden is beyond race, racism does not exist in Sweden, except in the mindset of the intolerant few, uh, have, cannot substantiate the claim. It's an ideological uh, claim that racism does not exist or do, do not constitute a severe problem uh, in Swedish society. Anyway, we have seen a process in Sweden similar to uh, the process that goes on in Denmark, France, the Netherlands, Belgium, Austria, Poland, Hungary, Turkey, the United States, uh, that tries to uh, ban or defund critical theory, gender studies, post-colonial studies, decolonial studies, uh, critical race studies. And to me, this is of great uh, concern. 
And I would like to close by uh, urging us all to defend academic freedom. Producing critical knowledge is not only a right, but a responsibility. And thank you. Thank you. And uh, almost everyone is back. We have until six o'clock, I would say, and we should use that time now to get together, ask each other questions or comment on each other, get a conversation going. And if I may uh, start by an observation um, and question, um, it would be the following. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but my observation about your uh, presentations is that we have collectively moved away from studying and understanding racism as something that is interesting because it's psychological or based on prejudices toward an understanding of racism as systemic or structural or a technology with often very subtle sometimes almost invisible measures that are very hard to detect. So in some sense, not only is there a new Cadillac, <laughs> but somehow, and here the image becomes problematic, racism has been updated in such a way that it has mm -hmm. become harder to detect somehow. And you are all scholars, mm -hmm. of course, so you are very keen and you see it. Um, I wonder whether in your research you know what this means for those at the receiving end, like the fact that it has become so difficult to pinpoint, um, does that make a difference? Oh, have we lost Chris, by the way? Because I would have thought that this is also an interesting question for him. Where's Chris? Chris yeah. is invisible, as I talk about invisibility. Oh, I think he how left sad. The, he left the Zoom session, I think. I, I don't know whether he- Where he is. Yeah. Oh, how sad. Well, anyways, he's not the only one, I guess, who, who can sort of respond to it. So my question, first of all, is do I get you right? You are all, in a way, on the same page, aren't you, somehow? Um, the question is, where do we go from there? Um, and what does it mean uh, for, for both your research and those at the receiving end? Yeah, Matt, you're nodding. Do you want to start us off? I'm sure I'd be happy to start off. Um, so first of all, let me say I really appreciate everyone else's presentations and, and learned a lot from them. So it's a real pleasure to have a chance to uh, be on the panel with you this morning. Um, Astrid, I think you've got it exactly right. I think that there has been a shift in terms of how scholars from all these different uh, disciplinary backgrounds, different um, uh, national locations are, are approaching the study of racism. Um, I think to, to answer your question, what do we do from here? I think the question of how we identify the, the problem of racism, I think determines how we identify how to try to push back against it or what um, tactics might be used. Um, I think during the time period I studied, there was still some discussion of um, racism being a, an issue of people's hearts and minds. Um, so mm -hmm. in the American context, it, actually the Swedish uh, social scientist Gunnar Myrdal, his book, An American Dilemma, um, was yeah. largely focused on um, the sort of deeply rooted prejudice that many Americans held, but how a lot of Americans respond to that was forming these kind of essentially book clubs or kind of social groups that kind of talk through the, the problem of racism. Um, even at that time, a lot of African-American social critics recognized that that wasn't enough, that the, the problems were institutional and, and structural and that it was about voting rights and about mortgage redlining and uh, about so school segregation. <clears throat> so I think in, in our present moment, I think if we identify the problems as being largely structural, structural in, in um, that face us, then a lot of the sort of responses are going to be probably policy based and trying to understand what are the the, the policies that need to change, what are the levers that need to be to be pulled um, to address the kind of very real life and death um, problems that face us. Um, but let me stop here, and I look forward to hearing from other folks. Please, Matthias. Sure. Ah, okay. 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 No, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for referring to Gunnar Myrdal. I think that was a rhetorical trick, though. Um, he wanted to appeal to Americans to find it a, a, a dilemma. I think that, that racism, of course, predates American democracy and, and they keep affecting the American dream. But he tried to get 
people on board uh, to fight it. So, so I think it was, this is, uh, in a way, a good title. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, I think that, that it's necessary also to understand that, that the system is not broken. It was made this way. Uh, so, so you cannot, I think, uh, only appeal to people's morals or ethics. I think we need really to move away from uh, a view on racism as exclusively uh, something uh, that concerns prejudice or ideas or figures of thoughts or ideologies. Uh, racism is practice. It's something that also may be reproduced irrespective of the involved actor's best intentions. Uh, so, I, so I really think that, but, but, but there are, I would also say that uh, there are some uh, things that makes me optimistic. I see the problems uh, rising on the horizon. I see the black clouds. I can I understand that we are moving right into the storm again. And Europe at least has been here before, so it's a great concern. But at the same time, we talk about the, the normalization of racism. We talk about racism as a problem. I think that this is different from what it used to be because I think that uh, racism was that normalized that it e didn't even had a, a name. It was just the course of, it was just nature. Uh, the ways things are, were supposed to be. Uh, and, and I think it's interesting that we start to conceive of racism as a problem, that we start to realize that, that racism is not part of nature. There are so many societies across the world back in history that were not uh, struck uh, racialized. So if racism has a history, it also means that we can, we can uh, imagine a future society without races. Hmm. Nicole and Devarchina, do you want to respond to this or bring in one of the terms that you mentioned that is um, trying to turn things around by talking about privilege? I mean, that's another option, isn't it? Um, that you seem to want to suggest to grapple with this, um, this in the this the subtleness of, of racism today as structural. I don't know who <laughs> I can quickly add um I think in my talk what I wanted to say was um uh, we talked about privileges, but I also wanted to just uh, emphasize on differences uh, or like inequalities that we begin with, right? Um, and I think um, one of the ways of invisibilizing is sort of not taking into account these differences that people start out with. Um, and this can be, of course, at various level. Um, and let's say, uh, so, just one small example would be not getting into something very, um, let's say the cultural differences. Uh, a person like me from India, uh, we let's say spend a lot more hours in, in the food that we eat, uh, preparing, cooking, shopping, thinking about and so on. And let's say someone from another culture doesn't do so, but we have like a standardized understanding of like what it means, what leisure means, what work means and so on and, and how uh, academics um, day should be divided, our hours of productivity should be divided. And I could continue this conversation and take it like, for example, um, we had a converse, I had a conversation with a colleague about uh, disability, for example, or even something milder like um, having sleep problems. So, but we, ex we expect the same kind of productivity from each individual. This is because uh, like there is a standardized idea of how our day should be divided, what productivity should look like and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I think when you are not invested in the individual and their individual problems and their private lives, 
uh, you can maintain these standardized ideas and in, in some sense that would perpetuate in terms of um, like peace academics from the global south like uh, what it means for us to come here our, the precarity of our stay here if we don't have the money we get thrown away there is no way to convert like let's say indian rupees to germany and therefore stay on our own money and so on and so forth so um i think that that is why i stressed in my talk the the need to understand people at the individual level and and look at their private lives because as if like uh, nicole said you, in our disciplines we want to separate emotions from uh like the academic output but i personally think that just is not tenable and when you do when you want to enforce such an idea then you basically are um, invisibilizing a lot of problems that people have to invariably uh, overcome right uh, so so as i said like this three year idea of um, you know the how how long it should take for a phd student to finish their work like takes doesn't take into account the different um, abilities and skills and uh, precarious states that people can uh, find themselves in um, and racism so my talk i know was not directly about racism but uh, racism sort of tends to perpetuate these kind of you know people with privileges continue to accumulate more um, more privileges and people who are disadvantaged mm -hmm. sort of tend to accumulate their disadvantages because the structures mm -hmm. say the same um, mm -hmm. yeah to comment on this um, again I feel it's um, what you're talking about is um, and several of you have touched upon this in their talks already is that um, as a consequence of a diagnosis of structural racism or technology then the next question is also how to um, be actively anti-racist right be because it's not just not doing something not refraining from prejudices but it is necessary to actively work against it and to have difficult conversations and to 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 um, to dare to bring up um, uncomfortable issues. Um, Matthias, you also ended up with a kind of, you know, asking us to engage in a certain way to do research. Yeah, but, but no, to defend the right to academic freedom, because mm -hmm. I think that what if, if you see what's happening now uh, across the United States, the attacks mm -hmm. on critical race theory, uh, you see politicians in Denmark uh, seeking to, to silence uh, critical studies of, of race and gender and, and thought. Mm -hmm. uh, you see the same process in, in uh, Austria, in Poland and, and Hungary, the law, uh, the state intervenes, closed down institutions in Turkey, they imprison people. Um, in Sweden, Belgium and the Netherlands, it's more defunding. Also in uh, very good studies you're doing there, super interesting, race studies, gender studies, but there are also other important subjects, let's fund that instead. And, and so, so it's done in Sweden with bureaucratic means, like what the exclusion of Roma people. It's, uh, it's never explicitly mm -hmm. said, uh, so they do it other ways around. And I think it's a great concern because our, I think as a scholars, if we are involved in this, um, in this field, uh, I start to get a little bit old now. I, I, um, I, 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 uh, I can see the differences of time. And uh, I can see how young PhD students start to self-censor um, the theories, the perspectives, their analysis. I see how supervisors start advising PhD students, maybe, 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 you're, uh, this is brilliant. Oh, the, the, these fantastic ideas to study structural racism, that's super, super, but, but maybe you should try something less controversial. Uh, and after when you get tenured, then maybe you can engage in this study. And, 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 and I think it's, it's extremely problematic. 
And, and I think we need to, to uh, sort of establish some kind of network of solidarity among scholars at risk. Um, and it works on, on several levels. And I'm happy to hear that in, in Tübingen, so it's, it's more discussion about privileges. Uh, but, but, but I know that in other places, it's uh, also a question about losing uh, your job or, or uh, not getting funded. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Matthias was also in a way pointing out that while on the one hand we are talking about the subtleties and the invisibilities of racism and the gatekeepers of resources, um, as Chris did earlier, at the same time we have burning mosques, yeah. at the same time we have shooting young black men. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's this, this, this two developments, on the one hand, it's getting more subtle and we, we use all our brain power to mm. unravel, reveal, point out, you know, the subtleties, but on the other hand, there seems to be still, or perhaps even a growing, not so subtle racism, a exactly. racialization, you know, growing tensions and people who are not worried about microaggression, but about macroaggression and death, right? Yeah. So this is, this is really difficult to keep together, I guess, yeah. Mm. Please join, I mean, unmute yourself, use the time um, to perhaps um, comment on this again and what you, where you stand, what you wanted to say. Um, for the remaining maybe five minutes or so. Mm. No, I think you're absolutely right that, that, that it is really, you know, racism has many faces. Uh, and you have all the subtleties and you have all these things that are reproduced without people having the intentions to. Some people realize that racism is a problem. Some people pay lip service to that. Uh, other people are, are people are dying from the same problem, and a lot of people are ready to go out to to the defense uh, of the system with means sometimes up to sometimes quite subjectively violent. Um, so so it, it does. We, we we are again at the crossroad. Uh, that we, uh, and we really need to to see that I think. Uh, but again, it's also, you know, the fact that we are actually discussing this, mm -hmm. the fact that, that problem, uh, racism is considered a problem. I think that, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that in Danish language, racism entered the vocabulary only in 1965. Before that, they didn't even have a word for it. Um, and, and, and uh, so now they have a word for it. And some people could therefore try to understand what it is and, and do something about the problem that now has a word. Uh, so it has become visible. And that, that's also an important step. Uh, and good to remember now when, when they really try to ban all racism studies, studies of Islam, uh, uh, Islamophobia and all of these things in Denmark. I was really struck in uh, Nicole and uh, Debrishana's uh, presentation about the importance of kindness. Um, I think it's one of the things I'll continue to think about after the presentation and, and think more broadly about what, what will or will not change, both in sort of the academy, but also in our societies more broadly, um, from based on the pandemic. I think that I think the, the kind of social interactions that the pandemic has, um, has prompted and has sparked some, some um, some moments of kindness that I would love to see continue both within the academy and more broadly. Um, and we we'll want to keep thinking about how to be intentional about making sure that those don't uh, recede into the rear view as things uh, start to stumble more towards um, normal as the pandemic hopefully recedes. Mm -hmm. I would like to add, um, because Nicole talked about emotional labor, that I think what we forget or it's so mechanized that we forget that part of the job, I think, um, if you are serious about, about academia, is, is doing this emotional labor. Like there is no, uh, or, or one should not think of actually academia devoid of this emotional labor. I mean, after all, we are in conversation, we are, this academic work is some, if I understand, I mean, it should be some kind of conversation that we are having either with our students or our readership, right? And 
I feel that, um, and, and as we keep in mind when we write a book, like how our readership kind of understands our ideas, I think generally too, when we are speaking to our students and colleagues, I think it's, it's important to first check if they are in the right state of mind to even have this conversation. So I think it, it's actually, it's a very basic kind of <laughs> idea, but we have um, moved to such a mechanized kind of understanding of humanities and like this uh, movement away from emotions that I think now it needs as if some sort of a reiteration for us to remember what was our primary duty in some sense. And um, the second thing that I wanted, to, I didn't get a chance here, uh, but uh, apart from the kindness and this uh, atmosphere that I talked about, the other thing is uh, the pandemic actually opened up academic opportunities uh, so much uh, to the global south and so on. So uh, I know I, I keep saying that when people complain about not meeting their colleagues and friends in real conferences and talks and so on, on the other hand, people from all over the world who could not um, travel uh, to these conferences have now the opportunity to register and be part of this. So, um, as I said, like in some sense, the pandemic has shown us different possibilities. And um, apart from this atmosphere of kindness, I think if we could also keep this openness, uh, sort of if we could continue to have like these um, discussion forums open to people from all around, uh, that would be something nice to keep from uh, this um, experience. Yeah, thank you, Labarchina. That's uh, really, that seems to be um, one of these unforeseen keywords that sometimes happen in a discussion like this all of a sudden you start with racism and you end with kindness and suddenly it becomes this crystallizing um, word. I wish I knew how to be kind to Chris who really lost us, never got back again. Um, I'm sure when talking about bureaucracies and in his case, of course, these are social welfare um, institutions, um, I'm sure he could uh, connect to, to kindness as well in this kind of context, which is really so crucial uh, for so many people. So I thank you very, very much for taking time and um, getting into a conversation. We all didn't know each other beforehand, but I think we did get to know each other a little bit. Um, tell all your friends and colleagues about this lecture series, because as you know, um, it has been announced um, at the beginning by Monique Scheer. I will remind you again, there is on the 28th, a continuation of this series on race, racism and decolonization. The last part, third part on decolonization on the 28th. Um, and um, that is something that you could again, spread the word and invite others or maybe even uh, zoom in yourself. Thank you very, very much. And um, yeah, have a nice evening or rest of the day, depending what time zone you're in. Thank you. Thank you for organizing this. And thank you everyone else of the panelists. I learned a lot from listening to you and uh, we see each other again. I hope so. Thank you very much. <laughs>